Amen. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, um, if you got a Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. You know, as I was thinking through what would be fitting a fitting message, a fitting sermon, and praying through it and asking God, what do I say to what do I say to my church that is six years old? What would be the message that would be suitable for where for where we are and where we want to be? And through the Holy Spirit, I think I landed here um, simply because this is a passage about about growth and about maturity about endurance, and what I realized was for all that we have been through from last year until now has given us every reason to walk away from the faith. That if there was ever a good reason to not be engaged with God and to throw your hands up and say, life is too much for me, this would be the season to do so. And so what I want to do today is look at a passage that will hopefully help us build on what we've already started and help us stay the course as we move forward as a church into all that God wants to do for us as individual believers and all that God wants to do through us as a body of believers. And so here's what you need to know that growth does not happen through accident. Growth does not happen by happenstance. If you are going to grow, the most growth typically happens when you're facing resistance. If you're working out, the more weight you put on the bench, the more resistance, the more your tissues start to break apart and the more you train your body to lift more weight, the more you grow. And so growth happens not in the easy times, in the easy seasons, but growth happens when the wind is towards your face and you gotta push through it. And so I think this passage will help us today to build on what God has already started and for us to move forward in what God is doing through us and what God is doing for us as a church. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 12 says this. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about rituals, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And we'll do this if God permits, for it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the age to come and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. For the ground that drinks the rain that falls on it and that produces vegetation useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God, but... If it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burned. Even though we are speaking this way, this is the beautiful, precious thing that, that he wants to communicate to them. Even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of the things that are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now, it's almost like he's addressing a different group of people. Now we desire each of you, everybody, to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to gather here today. Thank you for the people of God today, God. I, I pray that you would be with us today, that you would sit among us today. Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would work on our hearts and minds, that you would transform us. 
that you would open our eyes to see things that we have not seen before, that you would open our hearts to receive things and, and grow in a way, in a manner in which we, we look radically different from the way that we were before we came here. And so, Father, I pray that we don't just hear your word today. I pray, God, that we would be doers of your word, that, that there be something inside us that drives us and compels us and calls us to step into what you have called us to step into. That, that you want us not to be the same, but you want us to grow. And so today, God, I pray that Christ will be honored, that his name will be made great, that he will be lifted up today, that men and women will be drawn to Jesus today. I pray that our love would not grow cold, but our love would be warm today. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that we will participate in what you have to say, not just sit back and engage, but God, God that we would participate Fully engage ourselves, all of our senses, our minds, our bodies in what you have to say. And so, Father, we thank you for it today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. My sermon title today is It Doesn't Happen by Accident. It doesn't happen by accident. Getting older, getting older does not automatically equate to maturity. This is true in the life of an individual and it is also true in the life of a church. That if we want to grow as people, if we want to grow in God, as individuals, if we want to grow in God as a body of believers, it won't happen by happenstance. And what I mean by that is this. God has an element, a role that he plays in our growth and in our maturity. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to take advantage of all of the means of grace that God has given us for us to grow. God has and plays a role in our growth but we have ownership in our growth as well. Theologians like to call this notion God's sovereignty, human responsibility. That, that if you want to grow, God is not just going to grow you because you come to church and sit in a building. That, that God is not going to grow you just because you sit still and call yourself a Christian. But at some point, we have to allow the spirit of God to draw us and compel us to take advantage of everything that God has given us that pertains to life and godliness. That, that we have to use the things that God has left us if we want to grow. I think uh, evangelist and teacher of the 20th century, Oswald Chambers, put it best when he said this. Spiritual maturity is not reached by the passing of years, but by obedience to the will of God. Some people mature into an understanding of God's will more quickly than others because they obey more readily. They more readily sacrifice the life of nature to the will of God. And if I had to surmise the point that Oswald is trying to make is this. If a person or a group of people desire to grow up and into the fullness of God, it won't happen by accident. It does not happen by accident. And so what the writer of Hebrews puts forth before us today is that there will be things within and without that will impede upon the progress of growth and development that we have in Christ. And it is not OK for us to remain where we are. It is not OK for us to remain where we are. Being stuck is not OK. And so what he does is he put, puts two things before us, a warning about the dangers of spiritual stagnation and the dangers that come along with it. He, he, he supposes the idea, puts forth the idea that, that spiritual stagnation is not just stagnation, but it puts us in danger. That, that if we are spiritually stagnant and not growing, we are in more danger than we think that we are. And, and there's a present and imminent danger to everyone that has become spiritually lazy. It doesn't matter if we've dealt with a pandemic. It does, it doesn't matter if we dealt with politically political insanity. It, it does not matter. We still have a responsibility not to get apathetic toward the things of God. 
The second thing that he puts forth for us today is he puts forth not just a warning, but an encouragement. An encouragement to grow and an encouragement to hold fast to our faith. The writer of, the, of Hebrews in the fourth chapter, verse 14, he says, therefore, since we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, meaning let us not let go of that which we once confessed and know to be true. He expects us not just to grow, but for us to endure to the end. And, and, and essentially what he's saying is do not neglect such a great salvation that you have in Christ Jesus and the way to endure to the end is to grow and mature in the present and so if you're asking me what is the antidote to spiritual stagnation the antidote is it is for us to grow if you grow then you don't have to worry about being spiritually stagnant if you take ownership of your faith and if you take ownership of using all the means of grace that God has given us if we we take ownership of reading our Bible if we take ownership of praying and staying in community and serving in the local body and, and, and giving in the local church. If we do those things, we will constantly be growing. God will work and coincide with us. He's sovereign over our growth, but we play a part in it. And if we do that, we can combat spiritual stagnation. Let me let me even make it more plain. Because oftentimes you can be in a context Two different people can be in two different contexts and get two different results. There's, there's a reason why that two children can grow up in the same household with the same parents, with the same nurture and in the same instructions and have two different, totally different outcomes in life. One can flourish and one cannot flourish. There's a reason for that. There's also a reason why two believers can sit in the same church under the same teaching, under the same pastor, nurturing and care. And you have two different outcomes. One Christian is flourishing and one is not. And the reason for that riddle is this. It is not about the seed that is sowing, but it's about the soil that the seed falls on. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of soil are we? That maybe we're not growing. It's not because the pastor is not preaching the gospel or communicating truth. Maybe it's not because you don't have opportunities to serve in the local church. Maybe it's not because they don't provide opportunities for you to be in communion with other believers. But maybe it's because your heart is hard towards God and you have yet to open up your heart and receive the seeds that are being sown in fertile soil. And so there is a danger for the one who hears the instructions and does not heed the instructions and therefore does not flourish. There, there is a danger in that because when you choose not to grow, you make yourself more susceptible to being knocked over when trouble comes. This is what happens. When we are not growing, it is difficult to come back when life happens to us. But for people who are already flourishing, People who are already rooted and grounded in God and the gospel and realizing that this life is perfect. He didn't call me into a perfect world with perfect scenarios and perfect people and perfect circumstances and perfect jobs and perfect relationships. No, he didn't call me and said, I'm in an imperfect world serving a perfect God and whatever comes my way, I am looking to him to finish my faith. But if a pandemic happens, if you're not rooted and grounded in God, you can simply fall away. If sickness knocks on your doorstep, you can fall away. If a breakup happens, you're not rooted and grounded in God. The church will be wondering what happened to you. And the truth will be revealed that maybe you were not firmly rooted and planted in God, but maybe the circumstances were ideal for that season. And what he puts forth for, for us in verses 1 through 3 puts a picture for us how a person goes from spiritual immaturity to maturity. From immaturity to maturity. The aim of the Christian life is for us to be more like Jesus. 
But it is not just for us to do on our own. It is God-assisted growth in tandem with personal responsibility and communal engagement with a body of believers. Let me say that again. How do I grow? How do I grow? Because God assists us in this growth. It's called the Holy Spirit. We also take some personal responsibility of our growth. And we also take personal responsibility to put ourselves in a context of communal engagement and participation to ensure that we are growing. Let me say this. I'm going to say this next week and I'll say it this week to give you a precursor. Your salvation is a community project. It is a community project. And so in this, he essentially is implying that we all should be invited into this journey of growing in maturity together. That, that, that if you are going to grow, if we are going to grow and be who God called us to be, if we're going to grow into his image and into his likeness, we must do this together. And the goal is not just for us to be mature, but the goal is also for us to start and finish. That, that you know people, I know people who were once in church. You know people, I know people who once professed and said that they love God. You know people and I know people that we serve in youth group within church. You know people and I know people that are in our families with some of the most faithful people that we know. But life happened to them and now they are nowhere to be found and now they doubt that which they said they once believed. But we can't be naive enough to think that at some point if we don't continue in the things of God that that won't be our portion. And this is what he's laying before us. And so here's what he says in verse one. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on and go on to maturity. And he names six things here, not laying a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about rituals, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And I want you to see those six divided into uh, three different couplets. The first two deal with this idea of justification. The second two deal with sanctification and the third deal with glorification. Now, these were things that they should have been aware of coming out of context of Judaism, where they thought about their salvation through I, I, the idea of works and the sacrificial system where well, they now as Christians should have moved forward and knew that salvation was not by works but that they were justified before God because of what Christ Jesus did and the blood that he shed on the cross for them and so you got this idea of justification that's presented in the first two justification means this that by God's grace we are declared righteous through the blood of Christ and the, 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 the second couplet, the next two, it talks about ritual washings and the laying on of hands. It's dealing with this idea of sanctification, the process by which believers grow in holiness through God's help and personal initiative to use the means of grace that God has given us. And the last two deal with this idea of glorification. It points us to the hope in the resurrection that awaits us after the grave, that we will at one point be resurrected and raised and get these glorified bodies, go to meet God in the air, come back to reign with him in the new heavens and the new earth. That is actually what we all should be looking forward to. So he deals with all of these things and they are foundational and we must understand them because we need a solid foundation uh, about our faith and at some point these things should be second nature to us but at some point we have to move forward. And so no one, no one lays a foundation with the purpose of never building something on top of it. You only lay a foundation if you plan on to continuing to build something. And this is what he's presenting for us. And so at this point, what he's saying is that you should already know what the gospel is. You should know what Christ has done for us. You should know that your identity is in him. We know that the motivation and reason, reason for what we do is a response to what Christ has already done for us. We know because of his substitutionary death on the cross for our sins that we have been forgiven, that our slate has been wiped clean, that we are a new creation in him. Because of the resurrection, we have been raised with him and we have a resurrected life in union with Christ. We know all those things, but there comes a point in time in the life of an individual, in the life of the church, where if God is willing to move us forward in the maturation process, we need to resign in ourselves that that is what we're going to do, that I'm not going to just stay here at the foundational stage. Stuff, I'm going to add and build on to what the foundation is that has already been laid. That means I am going to continue to grow in my faith and be available for God to use me however God sees fit. So this is a call not to get stuck. 
And some of us have been stuck since the top of last year. Some of us have not recovered. So let this message be sort of an annoying wake-up call. Let this be an alarm that you don't hit snooze again. Set the alarm for 6.45, it's 7.30, and you've snoozed seven times. Let us try to wake up on the first time and respond to God. This is a call to advance against immaturity and stagnation. In the Christian faith, to stand still is to actually go back. To cease making effort is to lose ground. So when I say effort, I don't mean that you earn your salvation. We know that's not true. We're not saved by works, but because I am saved, I will do work. God is calling us to move. The person who takes responsibility for their growth will be like a tree planted by streams of flowing water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaves do not withers. And what that man does, he will prosper. And God is calling us to be like a tree planted by flowing streams of water. That, that he intends for us to grow. But those who do not grow in their faith, those who do not have a solid foundation and build on the foundation, will be like those who are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. By every YouTube video that you see. But everything that you see that throws some sort of or casts some sort of sort of doubt on what you believe about God in Christ, that, that if they use your ethnicity against you to say that this is the religion of some other people, that, that you don't go fretting. That you are rooted and grounded in what you believe. And because you've been building on that, you understand the hyperbole of it all. That, that no matter what new age movement comes out telling you that you can visualize what you want or that you can think your way to the top or that you can climb the corporate ladder of success by speaking things into existence, that you don't fall for the nonsense. That you know because you have a firm and solid foundation that the scripture says it is the God who speaks things that are not as though they were. But you only know this and affirm in this if you have a solid foundation. This is why it's so important for us to grow, because when we don't, any little thing will knock us over. The pandemic should have happened and we should have said, that's all you got? I'm going to take this as an opportunity for God to continue to grow me in patience, in long suffering. And this is what he's calling us to. And then he presents to us in verses four through eight, the danger of falling away but also the blessing of faithfulness. So verse four, I'll be honest. Verse four is one of the most frightening verses in all of scripture. Verse four is extremely frightening because it says that it is impossible, impossible to renew repentance to those who, once, who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's word and the powers of the age to come. Th these are people who were members of the visible church at a point, made a profession of faith with their mouths, participated in the life of the church, but fell away from the faith. And now they repudiate and live to disprove that which they once said they believe. And so it is these people. It is the unrepentant denial of Jesus and who he said that he is. And these are people that were once in life that tasted the goodness of God that understood the gospel and believed it to be true, that partook in the Lord's Supper, that got baptized, that experienced the gifts of the Spirit, that lived in Christian community, that witnessed the life-transforming power of the gospel and enjoyed it. They liked the preaching and they still repudiated Christ because life happened. This is not, should not be strange for us if we look through the tapestry of Scripture. 
We'll see the children of Israel in the wilderness. Some of them had the blood placed on their doorposts, had ate the Passover lamb, miraculously crossed the Red Sea, observed the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night, tasted the miraculous waters of Marah, ate manna every day, heard the voice of God at Sinai and still denied him and died in the wilderness. It is crazy to see the miracles of God, see the life transforming power of God at work and still deny him. The, the New Testament comes and the Pharisees, they've been enlightened by Jesus and they still plotted to kill him. King Herod, John 6 tells us that King Herod loved to hear John the Baptist preach and he still killed him. Judas was around Jesus for three years saw what happened with the fish and the loaves. Jesus turns water to wine. He saw the demons be cast out. He saw the sick get healed. He saw people get raised and brought back to life and he still denied Jesus for a little bit of change. So it is possible to be around the things of God. To it. You can experience God and not ever enter into salvation. And we will be be naive to think that that could never be us. And this is the danger of being around the life of the church and even participating, but never truly fusting, uh, trusting in God. The dangers of being in proximity without bearing fruit is that a person can become what the Bible calls apostate. And you can fall away from the faith, meaning that you can make a profession of faith with your mouth that you can serve in a church. You can sit under sound teaching. You can take communion with the saints, receive the blessings and benefits because of God's goodness. Well, you mean to tell me God will show his goodness to those that are not even true believers? The Bible says that he reigns on the just and the unjust. And then you can come to a point in your life and because of persecution, because of trials, because of setbacks, because of sickness, because of whatever happens, and deny that God is good and become an enemy of that which you once proclaimed to believe. It is possible to stand right on the cusp of faith and never completely give ourselves to it. We can be around God and the saints, but never actually trust him. And if you haven't been following along and this is hard for you to keep up and you seem a little bit lost, I mean, I think I may have a practical example. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about the other day. Growing up, kids, we have a lot of stuff where I was from, but you go to the mall, go to the mall. You know, you hang out in the mall, and there's one place you got to visit in the mall while you're there if you're going to be there for a couple hours. It's a place called the food court. And some of us were food court kids. Some of us still go to the food court. You know what's the interesting thing about the food court? You know what I look forward to? Them little toothpick with the meat on it. Oh, don't let you be hungry. You know where to go. You know you go to the spot. And they like got the thing out for you. They got the little too big out. You're like, yeah, let me try that bourbon chicken. And you try the bourbon chicken. Oh, this is good. Let me try the sesame chicken. Oh, this sesame chicken is good. Let me try the orange chicken. Oh, the orange chicken is good. Let me try the, my favorite, that General Sal's chicken. Oh, don't nobody do it like General Sal. Yeah, let me taste it. And you taste and sample all of the chicken. And they ask you, do you want the meal? And your intention was to get full, but never commit to buying anything. And some of us have turned into food court Christians. And we keep coming by, let me taste a little Holy Spirit. Let me taste a little small group. Let me taste a little bit of the sermon. Let me serve a little bit. And we never plan on committing to God. But if you are going to get the full nourishment of the meal and all of the things that will benefit you as a person, then you got to commit and buy the whole thing. By the whole thing, let us not be food court Christians. So the danger is that he says that we can experience all of that 
and deny him, meaning that we crucify the son of God all over again, meaning that we stand with those who crucified Jesus. How is that possible? You mean Jesus can be re-crucified? No. What he's saying is this, that if you profess the sufficiency of his death on the cross for you, you said that his blood covered your sins, that you were forgiven, that you trusted in Christ and his finished work and his atoning death on the cross. You trusted in all that. You believed it at one point in time. And then you go out into the world and say that, nah, I don't really believe that. It's not really true. He didn't forgive my sins. Essentially what you're doing is you are taking the nails, you are taking the hammer, you are taking the crown of thorns, and you are re-crucifying him all over again because you're saying what he did the first time was not sufficient. And that is the danger. It is to suggest that Christ's sacrificial provision was somehow insufficient for us. But Peter, in his second letter, said, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it and to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. That it is a danger to profess God and then turn away from him to say it was never true. And if you're sitting here today and you're examining your own life, your own struggles, your own shortcomings. And if you're wondering, if you fall into that category, you know that you trusted him, but you don't see the evidences of bearing fruit in your day-to-day -day life. Like still some very strong remnants of the old nature that are prevalent in your life. That if you are seeing that and you're asking the question, am I really saved? The simple fact that if you're asking the question, am I really saved, is an indication that you are. The problem would be to say, say me, I'm good. And I'm good. But let us examine our own hearts and our own lives. Not because what he did wasn't sufficient. But we must hold fast to the confession of our faith. That it does not matter about how we started, but it's a matter where we are. And the good news is this, that we are not the authors and perfectors of our faith, but Jesus is. And if we have trusted in him for salvation, the father said it like this. Jesus said the father said this in John 10, 28 through 29. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So if you are in the hands of Jesus, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That your salvation in him is secure. And here's what he puts for us puts before us in verses 9 through 12. He puts before us better things, better things that pertain to salvation. And what he exhibits for us is a demonstration in diligence and endurance. He calls us to be diligent about our faith, but he also calls us to endure. And here's what he says, verses 9 through 12. And even though we are speaking this way, dearly loved friends, in your case, we are confident of the things that are better and that pertain to salvation. And here's this beautiful, precious promise. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work. People will often forget what you've done, but God will not forget. And the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve him. That's key. Not by what you did in the past, but what you're doing right now. That by continuing to serve them. Now we desire each of you. He calls everybody in the lazy Christians and the hard workers. Now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy, but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. And he gives two reasons for confidence in their salvation. Number one, what he believes about them and number two, what he knows about God. And here's what he knows about them. Their love and their work that they've demonstrated toward the other saints. 
A sign of authentic and genuine salvation is not just you professing that you love God, but that your love for God drives you and compels you to love other people. That if you are the king of your own castle, then maybe the love of God is not driving you. But if you love God, there is no way that that love is not expressed in the other people. It amazes me the people that say they love God. I'm good with God. I just don't like people. But God's greatest command was this. To love God and love your neighbor as much as you love your selfish self. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. You can do all of that, but if you don't love God and love people, it amounts to nothing. And this is what he calls us to. That if we love God, it fleshes itself out in love for people. And oftentimes, that doesn't just flesh itself out in the world, it fleshes itself out in the body of Christ. That he calls us all to be partakers. I love it because it almost assumes that salvation has a look. That that salvation has a proof. There's a validity to salvation. Like there's a tangible nature to salvation. Over a long and extended period of time, you can see people that bear fruit. It takes time to know that something has been firmly planted and entrenched and can withstand and grow in spite of inclement seasons and changes in the weather and still bring forth fruit. You don't know you're growing until you have to go through something, something that is not ideal and something that is not favorable, some hard circumstances, some financial setbacks, some sicknesses, some disease, some loss, some breakup, some divorce, some all kind of stuff, and then still pursue God. You don't know you're growing until you can go through that kind of stuff and still keep going. But is it really growth if there's never any pushback? The scripture says that Jesus learned obedience by what he suffered. That if Jesus' path to glory was not met with resistance, what makes you think yours won't be? And we share in this life with him, which means that if we are to grow in him, we must go in the path that he went. And in verses 11 through 12, the writer of Hebrews invites everybody to go along on the journey. But I want to read something that Paul wrote to Timothy that I think accurately depicts and paints the picture of our present circumstances in the world. Here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. Let me say this. Some of you are thinking last days is going to be something crazy where the sun is going to turn a different color and there's going to be some gold pixie dust sprinkled around. That's not last days. Last days started when Jesus got out of the grave. And here's what he says. For people will be lovers of self, check, lovers of money, check, boastful, check, proud, check, demeaning, check, disobedient to parents, check, ungrateful, double check, unholy, three checks, unloving, four checks, irreconcilable, a lot of checks, slanderous, Check. Without self-control. Check. Brutal. Check. Without love for what is good. Check. Traitors. Check. Y'all missed that. Reckless. Check. Conceited. Check. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All the checks. Holding to the form of godliness but denying the power. It is possible to do all the things not have any of the power. And this is what he's warning against. This is what he's warning against. But he's also encouraging us to thrive in that same environment. That your relationship with God is not just about you and yours. But your relationship with God is about you growing in God so that you can flesh that out in service to other people. And this is what he puts before us.
us. Jesus himself said, because of lawlessness, because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. This is the world that we live in. But let the coldness not be our portion. Let us burn with the flame of God in our hearts. Let us be passionate people who pursue his presence. Let us grow up into all that God has for us. Let us never stop pursuing God and the things of God and the people of God so that God can use us how God sees fit. Now I want to read this last thing to you that was characteristic of the people that he was addressing in this letter, and I'm done. Here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 36. This is what they went through. This, is what, this was their environment, but this is, what, this is what was characteristic of the ideal people of God. Here's what he says. Remember the earlier days when, after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you are publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. And at other times you were companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted the joy, the with joy, the compensation of your possessions. Because you know that you yourselves a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised to you? That if we are going to be who God calls us to be, there will never be perfect conditions. But we must press forward anyway. And the question we should be asking ourselves now is, God, how do you want to use me? God, what ways of growth have been presented for, before me and I did not lean into it. And we make all the excuses. I need the perfect church and the perfect people of God and the perfect location and the perfect pastor and the perfect role in the church. You're not looking for a church. You're looking for a social club. That's not what the people of God are. The people of God are people who demonstrate authentic, genuine faith in a company of misfits. In a group of people who would have never chose to be together. How else would we grow? How else would we be challenged? How else would we be able to bear the fruit of the spirit if we are not in an environment that's conducive to growth? And the environment is oftentimes that is conducive to growth, I'm not talking about toxicity, but I'm talking about environments where there will be some challenges. There will be some difficult people. There will be some difficult tasks. There will be some difficult responsibilities. There'll be some diff difficult seasons in your own personal life. There'll be times where you want to give up. There'll be plenty, plenty opportunities to quit. But when you are in the company of believers, this is where you lean on them and God to bear fruit for the glory of God. And what I'm saying to you at six years old is this. We've laid a solid foundation. Now it's time for us to build. Now it's time for us to build. Now it's time for us to experience true godly growth. And we have to decide what that looks like. Who do I walk away from? What do I turn from? What do I renounce? And where do I need God's help to trust him more? I don't know the answer to that question, but you do. And God does. And this is what he's inviting us into. That there is work for us to do. We come here. We sit under the word of God. We let it fall on fertile soil. 
and then we grow into it. God, how do you want to use me? God, why am I okay with standing on the edge but never giving in? God, what part of me and what part of my life am I just withholding because I'm waiting for it to be like I think it should be? If you're waiting to serve or waiting to give or waiting to be engaged and waiting to participate, it will never be the perfect time. There's an adage that says there's no time like the present. And I think the present is today. If you want to grow in God, remember this. It does not happen by accident. It does not happen by accident. Let us pray. Hey, I pray that you are blessed by the message that you just watched. Hey, the gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that the gospel calls for us to respond is through our giving. God gave extravagantly to his people by giving his son. And so we give financially, we give not to get something from God, but we give as a response to what God has already given us, which was life through his son. Hey, why don't you consider partnering with us financially by giving to the work of ministry? Hey, we do so much in our community to be a blessing to those around us. We're not here in the business of taking, but we're in the business of giving what's been given to us. And so, hey, why don't you go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give to the work of the ministry that is being done through the outpouring. Hey, once again, I pray that you've been blessed and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.